Okay, folks, so welcome to our last day of the week, lesson five, introduction to cellular respiration. And we are really gonna start to tie in a lot of aspects from the previous lessons. I feel like I say that every single day, but we're really gonna tie this into the general idea of what cellular respiration is and how we use all of our previous uh, understandings to kind of help figure out how the cell makes that ATP and the process with which it goes through in order to do that. Because it is quite a lengthy and um, detail-oriented process. So I wanna to try to break it down into as many chunks and parts as humanly possible. So recall that photosynthesis and cellular respiration, they really rely on each other to continue happening. Cellular respiration requires uh, all sorts of different types of nutrients, but mainly it requires sugar in order to go through what's called aerobic cellular respiration to produce ATP. That sugar is produced by photosynthesis. And photosynthesis produces that sugar as well as oxygen as a byproduct. Cells in animals and any microorganisms that go through cellular respiration, they utilize that sugar and that oxygen to produce ATP. And their waste byproducts are, surprise, surprise, carbon dioxide and water, which photosynthesis then uses in conjunction with sunlight. And that process continues ad infinitum. So the most important thing to connect to this idea is that respiration, cellular respiration and photosynthesis are that big cycle I'm talking about. The products of one reaction become the reactants of another. Uh, they are in lockstep together. And effectively, what this means is that they rely on each other to continue happening. Uh, they, the storing of that energy from the sun as chemical energy and glucose is then created into ATP energy which is then utilized by the cell. And again, that cyclic nature of photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration is the big idea to take away from this. So what is aerobic cellular respiration? It's that process that uses oxygen to convert food into stable and usable free energy that the cell can power itself with. And it does so via ATP synthesis, synthesis meaning, meaning the creation of ATP. So we have a net chemical equation here that you're going to have to know. And the general idea with regards to this net chemical equation is that we are going to have that negative delta G, which means we have usable free energy to make ATP. So that chemical equation works as following. It is C6H12O6, or some type of sugar, glucose mainly in this, in this example, plus oxygen gives us six carbon dioxide and six water molecules, as well as free energy. Humans and other animals are examples of what's called obligate aerobes. We cannot live without oxygen. That is why human beings that don't have an adequate supply of oxygen in some way, shape, or form uh, we die because in order to produce enough energy for our cells to function and multiply and send messages to all sorts of other cells, it needs to have oxygen as a means to produce that ATP. And that ATP, again, that currency of energy for any cell within the body. So in order for us to survive as a species, as an individual, what have you, we are known as obligate aerobes. We need oxygen in order to survive. So cellular respiration can be broken down into four stages. And I'm going to look at each stage with you in, in lockstep. So the first stage is called glycolysis. Glycolysis happens in the cytosol. The cytosol, if you recall from our uh, introductory components to cell structures, that's that cytoplasm, the liquid out or within the cell, within the cell, but out of the mitochondria. And we're going to become quite familiar with the cytosol and the mitochondria as we move through these lessons, because understanding what happens where uh, is quite crucial in terms of the steps that you'll need to know. So that glycolysis happens in the cytosol is the first stage of aerobic cellular respiration. The second stage, the second stage is the pyruvate oxidation in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, mitochondrial matrix. So this is now we're starting to look at chemical processes within the mitochondria and how it contributes to that formation of ATP as a result of aerobic cellular respiration. So that's stage one and two. Stage three and four, look at the citric acid. So stage three is the citric acid, uh, citric acid cycle, or otherwise known as Krebs cycle. And this happens in the mitochondrial matrix as well. This is again, that process 
Uh, as you can see on the right hand side over here, it is a consistent step by step process that we're going to have to get familiar with in terms of each individual stage where ATP is produced, how it's produced, what the electron acceptors and donors are. So you can start to appreciate um, just how, mu how much detail there is with regards to cellular respiration. Because again, when you're thinking about uh, that slow utilization of glucose as opposed to that quick utilization of glucose, that slower process allows for that energy to be properly utilized into free energy as opposed to that fast burning of glucose, so to speak, that releases all its energy exothermically and can't really be used as free energy. So the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle is the third stage of aerobic cellular respiration. And then the last stage, which is where the majority of ATP is created, is called the electron transport chain or the ETC. This happens in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So we're gonna differentiate between the mitochondrial matrix and the mitochondrial inner membrane uh, as we move through these lessons. But again, these are the general four stages of cellular respiration. And we know that the vast majority of cellular respirations ATP comes from that electron transport chain or the ETC. All right, now we are going to start to look at ATP production and we're gonna to start to look at it in, in, in pretty general terms to start for today. But as we move through today's lessons and Monday's lessons, as well as a bit of Tuesday, we're gonna to start to build on that detail and build on the general idea of the specifics of how ATP is produced. Okay, so ATP production. We're gonna look at something called substrate level phosphorylation. And I already have that green star there because of how important this idea is. Uh, substrate level phosphorylation is the production of ATP by removing that phosphate group from a substrate and adding it directly to ADP. ADP is the precursor to ATP. It's that adenosine diphosphate. It's the molecule that we have before we create ATP. And, and we'll talk about that substrate level phosphorylation as a means to produce ATP uh, as we again move through the rest of this course. But this is the main chunk of that substrate level phosphorylation. That the main idea is going to be that we're removing a phosphate group from something and we're adding it to ADP, that precursor to ATP. So that's substrate level phosphorylation. And then we have something called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is that production of ATP by a series of redox reactions. Those redox reactions we've been talking about pretty consistently so far since we've started this class, uh, which is gonna result in ATP forming, and it's gonna utilize that ATP synthase that I kind of alluded to a couple of lessons ago. Again, this is where the vast majority of ATP is produced. This is where the vast majority of those chemical reactions that make ATP happen, everything leading up to it does produce some ATP in some way, shape or form, but it's all in an attempt to start to make those uh, precursors to kind of help make the vast majority of ATP. And we'll take it one stage at a time because it is quite detailed with regards to all the individual stages, but we'll, we'll go through those each at the time. But again, this is the main idea, this ATP production. Our, uh, the ATP is produced as a result of these two general ideas of phosphorylation at different stages of cellular aerobic respiration. So this is a good overview chart or a good overview of cellular respiration. If you ever just want to kind of come back and look at the general ideas of cellular respiration and all the information uh, that you're going to need to know, this is the big, a big, nice general overview for that. Okay, so what is the mitochondria? We talked about the vast majority of things happening. Three of the four stages happen within some capacity the mitochondria. So how or what is the mitochondria and how does it function? So if this ATP is also produced in the cytosol, why is the mitochondria known as is that powerhouse of the cell? Well, even though glycolysis produces a small amount of ATP, uh, com it's compared to the electron transport chain within the mitochondria, yeah, it's a joke, right? The glycolysis component of, of ATP production is a, as far as I'm concerned, a vestigial uh, process of really and truly the, the ATP production of old, old, old microorganisms. Once the mitochondria was 
uh, incorporated into the cell via that endosymbiosis that you looked at last year in grade 11. Uh, that's production of ATP, cellular production of ATP as a whole went through the roof and allowed for those complex structures to form. So the, the mitochondria is the powerhouse because of that electron transport chain. So mitochondria have what's called two membranes that create separate areas for the organ or from the organelle and they compartmentalize, they compartmentalize some of those reactions. So as a result of that compartmentalization, it allows for different stages to kind of happen. And you'll realize and, and you'll start to think back to that phospho or that um that phospholipid bilayer that we talked about earlier in some previous lessons and how it's important in terms of moving things in and out and creating that charge as a result of ions, you'll really start to see that importance here as we connect those two ideas. So the intermembrane space is the space between two membranes. Uh, there are going to be some chemical reactions that happen there. And then the matrix is the interior aqueous solution within that inner membrane. So we're going to call those membranes are bilayers with proteins, enzymes, uh, fats, all sorts of different things within it. And there's going to be that intermembrane that's the space between two membranes, which is very important distinction between that uh, phospholipid membrane. That's two membrane layers have created a space that allows for some things to happen in there. And then the matrix is just like in a normal cell. We have that aqueous solution within the inner membrane. So again, when we think about mitochondria and we think about the idea of how it evolved over time, prokaryotes, uh, they don't have mitochondria, okay? Most of them don't have it in the same context that we do. Some of them do have it, but the vast majority of those prokaryotes don't have mitochondria. Instead, they have what's called that glycolysis process. They also have pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cyto cycle within the cytoplasm. Um, and the electron transport chain happens on internal membranes taken from the cell membrane itself, but ultimately it's far less efficient. Uh, it is able to make enough energy for their needs, but this is why when we think about multicellular versus unicellular organisms, those prokaryotes, they, they can only produce enough in energy for an individual cell. It cannot really sustain any type of higher order structures as a result of lacking that mitochondria. So when we think about those prokaryotes, we think about what's called anaerobic respiration or the anaer anaerobic processes. What does anaerobic mean? Well, it's without oxygen. It's not going to require any oxygen. So as a result of it not requiring any oxygen, we can kind of look at that efficiencies versus inefficiencies when comparing it to aerobic respiration, which uh, you're definitely going to have to know for Monday's quiz. So I'll, I'll tell you that now in terms of thinking about it, being able to compare and contrast the general ideas for anaerobic and aerobic will really be able to help you out in general. So what are the two anaerobic processes? Well, anaerobic respiration produces energy using inorganic molecules. So those inorganic compounds or inorganic molecule molecules are going to provide that uh, final oxidizing agent. They don't use oxygen as that oxidizing agent. When you recall to the previous lessons that we've looked at, oxygen as that oxidizing agent, right? It doesn't have it in that anaerobic process, so it won't be able to use it. So instead, it will use things like iron, sulfur, and other inorganic compounds. It also goes through a process uh, called fermentation. This produces energy from an inorganic compound, and it's acting, it's using that organic compound as a result uh, for that final oxidizing agent. And some inorganic com or some organic compounds that it utilizes are ethanol and lactic or lactate fermentation. So when you think about the process of fermentation to produce things like bread, alcohol, um, what else is there really that it does? Uh, uh, industrial processes of fermentation. All of those things, those byproducts that we utilize, uh, carbon dioxide, ethanol, lactate, all that stuff that we utilize for food, drinks, industrial processes, uh, that's what that molecule or that's what that cell is using as that final oxidizing agent so we kind of harness it and uh and utilize it for our own needs so organisms that live in low oxygen environments uh including many prokaryotes like bacteria as well as some archaea and fungi utilize these two processes pretty much exclusively uh, again when i talk about that yeast that we use for bread and other types of fermentation we're talking about uh, 
uh, all the different uh, single cell organisms or prokaryotes that utilize anaerobic respiration. These obligate anaerobes cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. So there are several types of prokaryotes that, that desperately need no oxygen to survive. And in the presence of oxygen, it will basically, that oxygen is such a good uh, oxidizing agent, it will steal the electrons away from the other oxidizing agents that those prokaryotes use, and it will effectively kill that cell because it cannot produce energy. That's why when you think about things that need oxygen versus not need oxygen, uh, you'll start to see why it's so important in, in that context. So lastly, the thing I want to talk about before we stop this lesson for the day and kind of really start to focus on the general understandings of the introductory idea uh, is that idea of why did this come to fruition? Why did, what is the evolutionary advantage of the mitochondria when it comes to cellular respiration? Well, when we look at the general idea of evolution as a whole, uh, things evolve because they become better, right? Things evolve because they become better. When you compare aerobic cellular respiration, the use of sugar, the use of oxygen, the, and the formation of carbon dioxide and water, where oxygen is a reactant, take a look at that delta G that we have here. That delta G is the amount of free energy can, that can be utilized for the cell. When you compare it to anaerobic, where ethanol fermentation is the electronic, like we essentially make that ethanol to receive that electron, the delta G is significantly lower the delta G is significantly lower. As a result of that, you get more energy released in aerobic cellular respiration. And when you get more energy released as free energy, you can make more ATP. And when you can make more ATP, you now start to see the underpinning ideas of why uh, aerobic cellular respiration evolved as a means to create incredibly, incredibly complex organisms that can sustain life as a result of ATP creation through aerobic cellular respiration. Okay, folks, that's it for the lesson this morning. I know I'm, I'm being quite generous and quite kind by only giving you this one lesson. Look, it's already 9.20 and we're done our only lesson for the morning. Uh, it's mainly because I wanna give you a lot of time to take a look at this uh, concept of free energy and cellular energy cycle and then you can take a look at some of these homework questions. I'm going to give you about 30 minutes now to look at that. And then at about 9.50, 9.55, I'm going to release your next assignment for you all to kind of start to look at and digest. Uh, it won't necessarily need you to have a really deep understanding of everything within this unit already. So it's kind of like a standalone assignment. But as we move through the lessons and as we you move through the assignment, you'll start to see where those connections are. And, and hopefully it will kind of help you along that assignment journey. Okay, folks, so that's it for the lesson. Uh, I look forward to the questions you have and I will answer them in chat now.